If you would, just bow with me for a prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. We surrender our hearts to thee, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak to thy flock. Dear Lord, please help me to feed thy lambs and to feed thy sheep. Dear Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm not worthy to even present this message, but it's very important and it needs to be presented. Please help me. I humble myself before thee, Lord, and before the congregation, that thy name might be glorified. Please do go before, during, and after this message, and please help us not to be the same because of thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Very thankful for the, for the mothers, and I would just like to say happy Mother's Day to all, all the mothers and uh, and those, uh, and also a, a mother that's going to, expecting a child soon as well, and her husband. But we praise the Lord for his, for his uh, loving kindness toward us. But I'll just like to say I, I appreciate the, the work that, that my mother is doing in helping out dad. You know, not only is, is she spouse, but she's also being a nurse to dad and, and uh I appreciate that. It's a lot of work. It's a work of love. Well, we're going to be looking at in the courtroom. And so uh, first I want to ask a question, but I don't want anyone to raise their hand, please. All right. Just think of it to yourself. Who has ever been in a court of law? Now, it could be innocently enough because somebody might have been a deputy, perhaps, maybe a lawyer or a judge. Maybe you had to go for jury duty. But most of the time when somebody has to go to court, it's not a pleasant experience, right? It's not, it's not pleasant because it's going to probably cost you money, your time away from work, and because of possibly what you have done, it might cost your freedom. But be that as it may, the court system is a very important part of our society, you know, to uphold law and order. Out in, in Hillsville, we have the county court, and we're very blessed to have that. We have a very nice one. So there are judges there. We also know that there are uh, federal judges because we hear about them being appointed. But also there's a Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, the Supreme Court is the highest court in the land. So if you're an American citizen or if you're uh, visiting or whatever, it needs to be respected. And it's so important that it represents one third of the government of the United States. Who can remember what the three branches are? Executive, Executive the presidency, legislative, the congressional bodies, and the judicial, and that's the Supreme Court. So they're, they're very important. It's comprised of one chief justice and eight associate justices. They may continue to serve as long as they wish. You know, a lot of times we just say that they're appointed for life, and you could say that, but a more correct way to say it is that they may continue as long as they wish or until they retire or unless they pass away, unless they are removed from office by impeachment. They operate on a schedule that's very similar to that of school teachers. They start their work here in the fall, but a little bit after the school teachers, they start in October each year and they end in late June and early July. They hear about 100 to 150 cases a year. Isn't that interesting? They, they must be really working hard. <clears throat> and they, they only hear cases that concern the Constitution of the United States. And if for anyone that's interested, the, um, the, the building, they have a permanent building in Washington, D.C. United States of America, for anyone that's interested in that. 
But the Bible tells us that there is a court that's far higher than any earthly court, any earthly, earthly tribunal, any earthly uh, military tribunal, a high court in heaven, a court where there's no hiding of any evidence and where there's no appeal from its decisions. Now, we've learned in our previous studies that a court is now in session. It started on October 22, 1844. This is the investigative judgment, or we might call this the pre-advent judgment because it takes place before Christ's second coming. Now, this is the first phase of the judgment. The, the judgment actually has three phases if you study it out. There's the first phase, there's the pre-advent judgment, and uh, investigative judgment. Then there's the second phase when during the millennium, God's people will be going over the books in heaven and seeing how God decided in each and every case. We'll even be going over the, the, the cases and see God's decision in regards to the evil angels as well. Remember it says, do you not know that you shall judge angels? So, we'll, so that'll be your second phase. And then the third phase will be the execution phase of the judgment when sin and sinners are destroyed for time and for eternity. So in this current judgment, only those who claim the name of Christ and enter into his service will be considered. So we study that as well during the sanctuary service. The wicked will be will have their judgment, but that'll be a separate and distinct judgment, and that will be at a latter time. So the church will have its judgment, and the wicked will have their judgment. They will be judged. But the fact is that we all have a case pending before the bar of God, every single one of us. The investigative judgment has been going on now for 176 years. It starts with the faithful that are dead, and then it moves on into the cases of the living. That's how the process goes. It tells us in 1 Peter 4.17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? Our subject this morning is in the courtroom. You know, we've had an opportunity to look at the first angel's message, and we've had an opportunity to study out the sanctuary service. But now I would like for us to just hone in on the proceedings of the actual, what's going on in this courtroom, how that it all works. You know, in a court, there's always a judge, right? There's a judge, there's a defense attorney, and um, there's also witnesses, and there's, there's a prosecutor, which would be an accuser. So it is in the heavenly court as well. So we're going to look at this high court in heaven and see how these proceedings take place. Now, first of all, I want to ask the question, who presides in the judgment? Who's in charge? Who presides? Okay, this that's how it is. It, yes, it, the answer was given a judge. Now, that's how it is in this court. In the high court of heaven, it's a little bit different. But we're going to find this out. Who presides in the judgment? Daniel, come with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 through 11. And the prophet Daniel was given, was shown a view when all of God's people, their lives, their characters, their motives, everything was going to pass before the judgment seat. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. And it says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set. And the books were open. Now just go ahead and stay in Daniel chapter 7. So who's presiding in the judgment? The Ancient of Days. So we know that the Ancient of Days is God the Father. He presides in the judgment. And the good news is, dear friends, that He loves you very much. He loves you. And we can be confident 
that everything done in these proceedings will be done fair and accurately. We can be confident of that because God is just, he's holy, he's good. And we can be assured that judgment will be found in favor of the saints. It will be found in favor of the saints. So God the Father presides in the judgment. Now, who is the judge? Who is the judge? And we're going to find that out. Verse 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So the Son of Man is Jesus Christ. He's the creator of the whole world. He lived on this earth and he faced every temptation just like we must. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So he will be the judge, and he has a right to do this. He knows exactly what it's like. So he will be the judge. Now, John 5.22, come with me there, because it tells it very um, very plainly here who will be judging. John, The Gospel of John, John chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 22. John 5.22 For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment into the Son. Now, isn't that interesting? God the Father is not, not going to be the judge. He will be presiding. But all judgment has been given to the, to the Son. So Jesus is our judge. All right, so if Jesus is our judge, who's going to be our defense attorney? Well, defense attorney is an advocate. So who's going to be our defense attorney? I heard the answer. I heard the answer. 1 John 2.1. If you want to turn to your Bibles, the 1 John 2.1. We're going to find the answer right here. Now remember that Jesus is our great high priest in heaven. We learned about that. And he is doing something on our behalf that we're going to read about. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So Jesus is not only going to be our judge, but as our great high priest, he advocates on our behalf. And I'm so thankful that right now he's advocating on my behalf, in your behalf. But when this judgment is finished... That will not be the case. And he will receive dominion and glory in the kingdom that shall be everlasting and shall not be destroyed. So Jesus Christ is our defense attorney, and he is our judge. Now think about that. He's our judge and the defense attorney. What a divine arrangement. But he has a right to do that. He paid the right to do that with his own blood. Who will be the witnesses in this judgment? Now, a clue is remember that the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, right? So, verse 13 of Daniel 7. Daniel chapter 7, 13. Daniel 7, 13. I have it right before me in my notes. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. So now, we need to find out who the clouds of heaven are, right? I like how it tells us in the book, Great Controversy, page 479, the clouds of heaven represent the holy angels as ministers and witnesses in number 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands attend this great tribunal. So the angels are the witnesses. Now, the judgment is not to inform God. That's one thing that we, we need to understand. God is already fully informed. He is God. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So if God does not need to be informed, then who needs to be informed? 
Well, this world has been lost in sin. We're on quarantine. The redeemed will be coming from a world that has been degraded by sin. Both angels and the unfallen worlds would certainly feel uneasy about admitting anyone to God's kingdom who might start sin all over again. So the judgment will open to them every detail and answer any questions. Jesus will show them that they have been forgiven, that we have been forgiven, and that he has changed us into law-abiding citizens. Attended by heavenly angels, our great high priest enters the Holy of Holies and there appears in the presence of God to engage in the last acts of his ministration in behalf of man to perform the work of investigative judgment and to make an atonement for all who are shown to be entitled to its benefits. So that's very important. He, Jesus is going to make an atonement for all who are shown to be entitled to its benefits. Satan, of course, is the accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. And we as Christians are the ones being tried in this investigative judgment. Jesus has to look at our each and every case and see if we are fitted for heaven. Now, we've studied out the three angels' message in the sanctuary service. We've studied out the everlasting gospel. And all these are a call to repentance. It is an end-time message to a lost and dying world. It is a message of mercy. So right now, we want to repent. We want to confess. And we want to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. That's what we want to be doing right now. We want pardon written next to the sins where all, next to our name over our sins. We want pardon. And this will be in the records of the heavenly sanctuary. So we've studied, we've studied that out. Now is the time to surrender because the door of mercy is open. But it will not always be the case. It will not always be open. Every person that has entered the service of Christ must face their own life's record in heaven in the investigative judgment. And we need to think about that. Every name is going to come before God. Every name. But we're looking at the church right now. Every name in the church is going to come before God. And that judgment is taking place right now. It's taking place right now. So what will be the standard of the judgment? How will we be judged? Well, just like it is in our court system, the judge judges by the laws of the land. Well, it tells us in the Bible how we will be judged. So come with me to James chapter 2, verse 12. The book of James tells us how, what, by what standard we'll be, we'll be judged. James chapter 2, verse 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of what? The law of liberty. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So what is the standard by which we will be judged? The law of God, the Ten Commandments, that will be the standard. So what evidence will be considered? What's the evidence? Remember Daniel 7.10, the books were open. It talks about books. Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things which were written in the books according to their works. So you have a book of life. And there's also books that are records of our lives, even our tears, everything that we've done, records of all of our good deeds, as well as all of the bad deeds. It's all there. It's been recorded by the angels. Sins we have committed, sometimes that's called sins of commission, sins that we've committed, sins of things that we failed to do. Sometimes those are called sins of omission. 
Every thought, every deed, our very characters will be judged with no hiding of any detail. Have I used the time that God has given me for his honor and glory and for the salvation of souls? Or have I squandered my time just pleasing myself for my own entertainment? All this is going to be coming in the judgment. It's very important that we think about that. Sins that have not been repented of and forsaken will not be pardoned and blotted out of the books of record, but will stand to witness against the sinner in the day of God. That comes from a book called Great Controversy 486. And beloved, I, if, I could, if I just read that one statement and didn't say anything and sat down, that would be... That would be very important, and that would, that would be a lasting point. Sins that have not been repented of and forsaken will not be pardoned and blotted out of the books of record, but will stand to witness against the sinner in the day of God. Help us, Lord. As the books of record are opened in the judgment, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come in review before God, beginning with those who first lived upon the earth our advocate presents the cases of each successive generation and closing with the living. Every name is mentioned, every case closely investigated. Names are accepted, names rejected. When they have sins remaining upon the books of record, unrepented of and unforgiven, their names will be blotted out of the book of life and the record of their good deeds will be erased from the book of God's remembrance. You know, there's some Christians that are claiming right now that, that Christians don't have to face the judgment. That's something that you might run into in, in the community. But just like our scripture reading said, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Who was Paul writing to? Was he writing to a, a Christian church in Corinth? Yes. Yes, he was. And that message is to the church and to all the world. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There are some that claim that uh, once saved, always saved. Have you ever heard anybody talk about that? I've, I've run it into it in the community before. But we need to know what the Bible has to say about this point. This is very important. Does the Bible teach once saved, always saved? Come with me to Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18, verse 24. Because we want to know what the Bible has to say, you know, not just not what just uh, someone has to say, even even if they're a, a sincere preacher. What does the Bible say? Ezekiel eighteen twenty four. Now, th this is a very important verse because this verse is talking about a righteous person, a Christian that will be standing in the judgment. That's why this is so important. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? Now that question is talking about live in the judgment, receive eternal life. What is the answer? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he have trespassed, and in his sin that he have sinned, in them shall he die. He will not stand in the judgment. He will receive the sentence of death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The sanctuary message and the investigative judgment teaches plainly that there is no one saved, always saved in Bible religion. And that's what we want to do. We want to stand on the word of God, on the thus saith the Lord. So who will be counted worthy to enter into heaven? All who have truly repented of sin and by faith claimed the blood of Christ as their atoning sacrifice have had pardon entered against their names in the book of heaven. As they have become partakers of the righteousness of Christ, and their characters are found to be in harmony with the law of God, their sins will be blotted out, and they themselves will be accounted worthy to enter eternal life. 
Revelation 22, 14 tells us, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. I read in a book called Early Writings that there's a time when Jesus is standing in the most holy place, which he's right now, but this is right before the close of probation. And he's waiting and he's standing and he's just waiting if just one more person would come to him. And he's just waiting. And dear friends, I believe that that time is, is not too far in the future. Jesus is standing and waiting today, dear friends. Today is the day of salvation. Because when this judgment is finished, Jesus will step out of the most holy place. He will lay aside his priestly garments. He will put on his kingly robes and probation will be closed. The door of mercy will be closed. There'll be no do-overs. No do-overs, dear friends. The decree from heaven will be given. Revelation 22, 11 and 12. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, beloved, as we consider the serious matter of the investigative judgment, does it give us pause today? I mean, I think that we should all be concerned right now. We should be concerned. We should be concerned for our own souls, for the souls of our families, for our church corporately and our local church, and also for our friends, dear beloved. We need to be concerned for our friends. Remember in the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament that they were to afflict their souls. That's what they were to do on the Day of Atonement. Now that is the typical Day of Atonement that represents something that would take place in the future. Right now is what's called the antitypical. It's typical. It's the real and the true. The typical is just like a, a, a lesson. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a point, making a point and showing us what we should be doing. So if we learn from that, we need to understand that right now we need to be afflicting our souls. But we need to be afflicting our souls by faith, by faith in Jesus Christ and His atoning blood for us. Why is this so important to me personally today? Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle of evil. We have to be grabbing a hold of the Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me. And we have to resist in His power. We have to be doing this. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there's to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. And this work is more clearly presented in the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14. And so that's why that we've been studying this out. And that's why the three angels' messages needs to be preached regularly. We need to keep that before the people. We need to keep this judgment for, before the people. We need to keep the second coming before the people because Jesus is coming soon, dear friends. And we want to be, be ready. We must be overcomers. We must overcome sin. Satan is always trying to convince God's people into thinking that we cannot overcome sin. But beloved, by faith we can. I remember hearing a preacher talk about how that there was a cup of water that was set on a table one time. And there was this athletic, strong young man that was supposed to pick up this cup of water. 
But they convinced him. They kept telling him, there's no way possible that you can pick up this cup of water. It's impossible. They told it to him so long that he could not pick it up when any young child could have went and picked up that glass. And dear friends, that's what the enemy's trying to do to God's people is say that we cannot overcome. But Jesus overcame and he will overcome in our life if we let him. He has the power to overcome, not me, but through faith in him and his might and his victory, we can be overcomers, dear friends. Revelation 3, 5 says, He that overcometh, the shame shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Jesus is coming soon, and we're going to have to be overcomers. Overcomers of the works of the flesh, overcomers of the beast like we studied out, overcomers of her false doctrines, and overcomers of her image. In this great day of atonement, our work is that of heart searching, of self-abasement, and confession of sin, each humbling his own soul before God and seeking pardon for himself individually. Anciently, everyone that did not on the day of atonement afflict his soul was cut off from the people. God would have us work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. You know, some might say, I know this is true. I've heard it. I've heard it preached. I believe it. But in self-distrust, they might wonder, how in the world can I possibly stand in the judgment? I got pulled over by a state trooper about two years ago. And I got pulled over for an invalid inspection sticker. And so he took my license back to his car like that like the, they, they do, you know. And he came back and, he, and he, had, he had a ticket. Now, he had a ticket because I broke the law. I was guilty. And he had a ticket for me. But he was very nice. And before he handed me the ticket, he, he said something profound. He said, is there any reason that you know of that this vehicle will not pass inspection? He said that to me. And I thought about it just real fast. And I said, no. But actually, after he left, I, after I started thinking about it, I did think of something. Is there any reason why this vehicle would not pass inspection? And then, as he handed me the ticket, he said, if you will take this vehicle and get it inspected and show the court that you have complied with the law, then I will speak for you. He said that to me. He said, I will speak for you. He's going to speak before the judge for me. Oh, I was, and he said, and this fine will be waived. That's what he said to me. All I was going to have to pay was the court cross. Just as the state trooper would speak for me to the judge, Jesus will speak for us in the courts of heaven. I truly believe that that state trooper was going to speak for me. So we can believe that Jesus will speak for us in the heavenly court. We must truly believe God has forgiven us, washed us, and that he will finish the work that he began in us. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ, dear friends. Beloved, we have a friend in court. We have a friend in court. Romans 5, 1 through 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Like the state trooper, Jesus cannot excuse our sins. But he will show our penance and our faith. In claiming forgiveness for us, he will lift up his pierced hands to the Father and say, I know them by name. Behold, I have graven them upon the palms of my hands. And Jesus will clothe the faithful with his own righteousness that he might present it to himself a glorious church, 
not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Charles Wesley once wrote, Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. He ever lives above for me to intercede. His all-redeeming love, his precious blood to plead. His blood was shed for all our race and sprinkles now the throne of grace. Jesus Christ loves us so much. He came and died for us. He showed us the right way to live. And he ever liveth, liveth to make intercession for the saints, for us. He is doing all that he can to save us. He is willing to send out all of heaven that we might not stumble and fall in the sin. Praise the Lord. God will finish the work he began in you. Jesus has the right to forgive and the power to change our lives into a new life in him. We must believe that. We believe Jesus Christ. He has the power to do that. Beloved, God promises to acquit you in the heavenly judgment if you invite Jesus into your life and permit him to remain in control. Will you invite him into your heart today? Beloved, perhaps there's someone here that's never surrendered their hearts to the Lord fully. Maybe you've went to church all your life. Maybe you haven't. Maybe this is your first time to come to church. But dear friends, Jesus is calling you. Today is the day of salvation. If there is anyone here that desires to give their heart to the Lord, come forward right now. Give your heart to Him. He is standing there and waiting for you. He loves you with an everlasting love. With loving kindness, He has drawn you. Our closing hymn will be 294, Power in the Blood.